Uh, India is a subcontinent. <laughs> Shanghai, yeah. Mexico, Japan, Cameroon, Taiwan, Russia, Cameroon. Madison, Wisconsin. There we go. Brazil, Hungary, Spain. Oh, Silicon Valley. Okay, that's Diana. Area. <laughs> Area. And you don't you don't have to reveal where you're connecting from if you. Yes, you don't have to. There are no restrictions, and we do not use uh, nation of origin in any consideration for admissions. No, we don't. Okay, so um, for those of you just joining us, good morning. Thank you for joining us this morning. Um, this is the MCSDS admissions webinar for spring 2019 admissions. Um, we're gonna, we have several people who registered uh, to join us this morning, so we're just going to give them a few more minutes to join um, before we get started. Oh, it's in it's um, midnight wherever Ian is is at right now. We're sorry about that, but thank you for joining us. Well, if he's if he's if he's working on computer science and he's just getting started. Oh yes, okay. <laughs> Before the internet, um, we used to uh, we used to go in. Um, late in the evening because and, and do a lot of work late in the evening because that's when the computers were fast and were getting less use and then the internet happened and everybody started using computing for entertainment and then the evening became you know prime time on the internet and, and everything slowed down and so it was better for us to wake up early in the morning to be able to use the resources when nobody else was using them Still in the case in parts of Pakistan Okay, so let's see. Maybe we'll get started at five after. So one more minute for people to join. For those of you just joining us, good morning, um, good night, good midnight. I don't know, wherever you're coming from. It's, um, good, night. it's good morning. Yes, that's right. Good morning. Okay. Uh, we're just waiting for more people to join us. We had several people uh, register for this webinar. Um, if you're just popping in, go ahead and if you want to share where you're logging in from today, that would be great. It's just fun to see where everybody is joining us from. We should set up an app so that you get little pins in the map as, as people connect up. Oh, maybe next time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. let's add that to our uh, list Thanks. of things to do. Yeah. Okay, so we're five minutes into the hour, so let's just go ahead and get started. Um, again, for those of you joining us, thank you so much for joining us this morning, um, this evening. Um, let's see, uh, today we're gonna do the MCSDS admissions webinar, or MCS, online MCS admissions webinar for spring 2019 admissions. Um, we have with us John and um, Viveka. If you wanna go ahead and take a moment to introduce yourself, and then I'll do a quick intro of myself. Um, and then we can get started. Okay. Hey, I'm John Hart. I'm a professor here at the University of Illinois in the Computer Science Department. I'm also the Director of Online and Professional Programs for Computer Science, and uh, I run the MCS online program that includes the MCSDS. Hey, good morning and good evening, good night. Uh, my name is Viveka Kudavikuma. I'm the Graduate Programs Coordinator for Computer Science. Um, so I work with Christine and John and other faculty and I work in all aspects of the grad programs. Great. My name is Christine Martinez. I'm a graduate program specialist and academic advisor for online MCS. I work very closely with both John and Viveka. Um, so the way today is going to run is we do have a, a brief slide deck that we're going to go ahead and use to kind of cover some of the points um, most students have um, when applying to the program. And then after that, we'll do a Q&A. Um, we do have a Q&A uh, panel here. So if you could please drop the, your, your question into the Q&A versus the chat box, um, it'll make things simpler, simpler and we can actually catch your question there and address it from there. Um, so with that said, I'm gonna go ahead and record this session. Um, and then uh, I'm gonna go ahead and share my desktop here so we can go ahead and start with the slide deck. 
Okay. Can everybody see my screen? Yes. Let me move that out of the way. Okay. All right, great. So I'm just going to go ahead and get started. John and Vivica, if you would like to address the slides as we progress. Okay. Okay. I think the first one is for you, John. So what are we looking for? Uh, thanks for um, uh, joining the webinar and considering the Master of Computer Science and the Master of Computer Science and Data Science uh, programs that we've set up for uh, uh, a graduate degree uh, in both computing and in, in the data sciences. Um, uh, the University of Illinois Computer Science program is a top program. It's one of the top five programs in, in the U.S. and in the world. And the, uh, um, there's a lot of um, considerations we have for this program. Uh, we offer the program online as a way of providing educational opportunity to more people than we can uh, handle on campus in our limited classrooms. And so uh, ordinarily we have a very restrictive program and, uh, and, and, and uh, you know, it's very difficult to, uh, to get a slot in, in one of those classroom seats, but by uh, designing a scalable online program in this way, we're able to uh, um, offer the program to more people and also more flexibly so that you can take these classes uh, from home while working, while handling your family and asynchronously so that you can um, learn this material, get your degree, get certified and signal to uh, the world that you have a computer science degree from one of the top institutions um, uh, uh, all, all through the uh, uh, facilitation of online. So the first step of that process is being admitted to the University of Illinois to our computer science program. And so we look at the, an application, and that application includes your background. Uh, we get a lot of students from a lot of this different disciplines. It's a computer science degree, and classically, the master's in computer science, we would see students applying with a bachelor's degree in computer science. But increasingly, because of data science and, uh, and computing has become ubiquitous and, and part of every aspect of, of life, we're seeing students add a Master of Computer Science degree on top of a disciplinary bachelor's degree. Um, so we're seeing students coming from other areas of science, uh, biology, uh, chemistry, um, other areas of engineering, mechanical engineering, um, uh, materials uh, uh, engineering, uh, aerospace. Uh, we're seeing um, students with bachelor's degrees in the humanities and the arts and the social sciences. Uh, we're seeing um, applicants with uh, degrees in medicine or in law or, or other areas adding an MCS, a Master of Computer Science degree, on top of their other degrees in the same way that you would add an MBA on top of, a, of another degree to, to provide some evidence of, uh, of business administration uh, uh, knowledge. The Master of Computer Science is a degree you can add on top of other degrees to show some, some skill uh, and competence in applying computing to your particular area of, uh, of emphasis, uh, the area of the discipline um, of your other degrees. So we're seeing an increasing multidisciplinary audience and we've designed this degree to, to serve in that role, to be able to tack on to uh, degrees that are beyond computing. Um, in, in order to do that, though, you still have to um, be able to get through graduate level coursework in computer science. So you have to have some programming experience. You have to have some key coursework. So um, the qualifications to apply for this degree and to be admitted to the University of Illinois for computer science at the graduate level First is you have to have a bachelor's degree. Um, uh, we can't just give you a master's degree. The master's degree is designed to sit on top of a bachelor's degree. Bachelor's degrees are often very broad and multidisciplinary and master's degrees are very focused. And, and it's the combination of a bachelor's and a master's degree that gives you the master's degree qualifications. So you have to have a bachelor's degree. That bachelor's degree does not need to be in computing, but uh, if you have a bachelor's degree in some other non-computing area, we need to look at some critical coursework, and that critical coursework is in data structures. Um, we also need algorithms and object-oriented programming, object-oriented design. Most students have some, you know, a programming course. Uh, we need this second course. The, the first programming course often covers algorithms and object-oriented programming, but we often need that second course in computing that has data structures. If you want to look at our curriculum, we have a course called CS225. Um, part of our undergraduate curriculum, 
uh, that uh, that covers data structures. And so everything in CS 125, 173, and CS 225, if you look on our web pages, will have the, the necessary prerequisite material for our graduate level classes. So if you if you if you have a bachelor's degree in some other field, and um, then you would need to have uh, commensurate coursework to those three classes. And you can pick up those classes, um, uh, you know, through a community college or through other, other means. And then finally, um, you need a GPA. Um, typically, we're looking for a baseline GPA of 3.2 on a 4.0 scale, um, depending on, um, uh, you know, the number of applications we have and the number of slots we have available even for an online degree. Uh, that GPA baseline will, will fluctuate a, a little bit. But typically, we're looking for, um, for something at least a 3.2. That 3.2, that's coursework in the last two years of your bachelor's degree. So your whole GPA might be lower because uh, you, you may have struggled in the first few years of, uh, of uh, college and then did much better in the second few years of college. Well, we do a holistic admissions process. We look at everything. Um, and specifically that GPA will be calculated in the last two years of your bachelor's degree. Um, in addition, uh, if, if your bachelor's degree is a while ago and had a low GPA, there may be other classes that you've taken since. We will take a look at that and factor that in, especially in advancements of classes. If your GPA is low, you can take other uh, advanced computer science classes elsewhere and include those transcripts and we will consider those uh, we will also look at your GPA of your computing, uh, your programming classes, and emphasize those more than the GPA from other non-computing classes. So uh, those are kind of the guidelines for the GPA. But in general, you know, um, in order to maintain good academic standing, your GPA will need to be at a level of 3.0 or higher in your um, graduate level computer science classes. So it's important. Uh, that, that we know that you've got um, the background needed to succeed in, in those classes. Um, most of our incoming students will know, know Python, will know some kind of interpreted language like Python at a very high level of scripting language. It's, it also helps to know something like C++ or Java um, or, or you know, one of the production languages, one of the lower level languages. Um, in addition to that, because uh, there are tools for compiling, linking, debugging that we, you would use in a production language that, uh, that are helpful to get through some of the coursework. In terms of mathematical ability, um, we, we, we need some experience in linear algebra and basic statistics and probability. And you can pick those up in coursework or even, even in, in MOOCs. Um, one thing that I am um, uh, happy to announce is that we're developing a new course, CS400, that uh, is designed to uh, offer data structures for students that don't have the data structures prerequisite but everything else and we'll be providing information on how to get signed up for that CS400 class and that may be an option for some students that don't have a uh, bachelor's degree in a computing related area and don't have that prerequisite of data structures in, in their coursework so far. Um, anything you want to add? Um, so I, maybe we can look at a couple of the questions that students were asking related sure. to this. Sure. Uh, let me. Was there one in particular? They were asking because we have just spoken about CS four hundred class. Uh -huh. um, there are some questions whether they can complete the requirements for data structures using uh, MOOC classes, for example, the data structures class from um, San Diego. Yeah. So. Um, so ideally, we would like to see a data structures class or something at that data structures level of, of computing coursework in your transcript. Mm -hmm. So um, it's strongest if you can show it as part of your bachelor's degree. Um, also, you can take it at a community college or as, a, as an additional course a, after your bachelor's degree. That, that works, works quite well. Um, we can consider if you've taken um, MOOCs or, or, or other coursework, but we need something certified, and typically that's a specialization sequence. So um, you know, we, we don't give uh, we don't give course credit for MOOCs alone. Um, our courses are designed um, when we give university credit for our courses delivered on the coursework uh, platform on the on the Coursera platform. Um, the MOOCs represent just the lecture portion of those courses. In addition to those MOOCs that 
that uh, have the lectures and some quizzes and a few uh, a few assignments. Um, they, um, on top of that, we had things like proctored comprehensive exams. We we have uh, um, projects, uh, you know, semester long projects that you'll work on, um, and many other assignments uh, that are assigned at a deeper level and things that are TA graded. Um, with assistance from the instructor and the TA to help you through those assignments. That's, that's, uh, that's additional learning that happens as well as additional assessment that we need in order to confer university credit. So when you take MOOCs, even MOOCs in a specialization sequence, you are really getting the experience of, of sitting in, of auditing a class, of kind of showing up for a class but not signing up for a class, and um, so you don't get the uh, examinations and the other material. We can consider some of that, uh, for example, an entire specialization sequence in data structures um, and, and algorithms and so on. We can consider that in the application. It's just not as strong as showing an actual um, credit bearing course. So I'd, I'd point you to a, either an online credit bearing course or a community college credit bearing course for that. But keep an eye out for CS400 because that will be an online option or uh, available to people as early as this spring. Um, to be able to pick up that uh, um, uh, prerequisite. Okay, great, great. I'm gonna go ahead and just move to the next slide. <clears throat> Do you want me to take this? No, why not? So um, this is just uh, to go over what the application requirements are for the program. Uh, you can see there is a website that is um, posted at the top of the slide. And if you go to that page, you can see a link to the ap actual application um, portal, which is all electronic. Um, and then, so everything that you will submit is electronic. You, you, at this point, you do not need to send anything on paper for us. Application fees and this webinar is mostly for domestic students. So your application would be, uh, application fee would be $70 for US citizens, permanent residents. And if you are an international student, then it is um, going to be $90 for the application fee. The application portal asks for some basic information about your academic history, your personal information. So it is, it's a good idea to gather all that information before you start um, putting in your application. Let's uh, quickly go over some parts of the application. There are, um, it asks for three letters of recommendation. Do you want to? Sure. Uh, those letters of recommendation are optional. Um, we require those letters of recommendation for applications to our Masters of Science and PhD programs. Those are research-based programs where you're going to be paired up with an advisor and making, uh, you know, writing a thesis or, or a dissertation that's going to, uh, you know, uh, move forward the state of the art in computer science. The Master of Computer Science degree, the MCS, uh, degree is, is a coursework based degree. So it just consists of eight courses. There's no um, requirement to write a thesis um, uh, and to, to, you know, to make uh, that level of uh, advancement to the field. So um, uh, those letters of recommendation aren't needed for admission into the MCS. Um, it, we will look at everything in your uh, application. So if you include letters of recommendation, we will take a look at them and consider them. Where they become most helpful is if, you, um, if you're missing a prerequisite, like if you don't have some computer science prerequisite we're looking for, like linear algebra or statistics or even, even data structures. If you have uh, somebody that can speak to your specific abilities in, in, in those uh, areas, for example, a former professor or a manager for a place that you work, that can, um, and those letters of recommendation are most effective um, the letters of recommendation often say, you know, this, this, this person is a hard worker and, and, and uh, very studious and so on. But the thing we're specifically looking for are that the person writing the letter understands um, the data structures, the linear algebra, the things that we're looking for, and then can specifically address those points. So I'll give you that opportunity to include those in letters of recommendation. That's where they become most useful for the MCS application. But if you, if you don't have letters of recommendation, don't let that hold you up because we're really just looking for them to address those deficiencies if they're there and we will still consider your application even if it doesn't include letters of recommendation. Okay, thank you, John. Um, so the next, next part would be a statement of purpose. 
which can be a brief statement statement of purpose. We some of the questions we get are how long does it have to be? Are there formatting requirements? There are no formatting requirements. It can be a brief statement, and there are no guidelines uh, yeah. that are required. Anything from a paragraph to a page. page. It just helps us to get to know you. We uh, we look at all of these applications, and uh, it's good to see uh, uh, where people are coming from. And then, it, so it does not need to be a two, three page statement. Sometimes it helps guide us. Uh, the next thing that we'll ask for is a curriculum vita or a resume, and sometimes the statement of purpose will provide some explanation of, uh, of the items in the, in the CV or resume when, when they're just listed very briefly. Thanks. Um, so <clears throat> the CV or the resume is an important part because it does provide us information to help make good decisions and also um, to look for some exceptions that might be exemptions that might be available to certain students. For example, you might, you could be a domestic student who's had um, some of the previous educational experience in a country outside the US. And um, in, but you might have been working in the US or for, in some other countries, let's say for five years. And um, that helps us, the CV, a fully detailed resume or a CV allows us to look at your record carefully and to see, do you need to provide TOEFL scores or IELTS scores, or can you be um, allowed an exemption from those scores? So when you do the resume, especially in these days when I could be working for a multinational company, and I would list my company, but then I would not list where I'm located. And that's an important part of the um, equation for us to look at your resume. Please make a note. If you, if you say you are, for example, I'm working for Microsoft, please let us know where you are located for each of the um, time periods. Um, it should have a full um, record of your educational history so that we can match that up with what you provide in the trans in the application form itself. Because sometimes we do have to go back and look at the information to make sure that we have a full picture. And then the um, perhaps one of the most important parts of your application is going to be your transcripts. So. First part is at this point, we do not require an official transcript from you. We only need an unofficial transcript. So the unofficial transcript could come in different forms. You may have an old, you may have a copy of your official transcript and you can make a, make a stand copy of that. And that would be unofficial, even though you're copying it off of the official transcript because it's a copy, it is unofficial. Mm -hmm. What you want to do is, uh, copy both sides of the paper if it is if it has information on both sides. What we are looking for would be a list of all the classes that you have taken, and that should include, for example, a course number, a course title, when you took it, which semester, and then the grades that you have earned. So it could be a letter grade depending on where you went to school, or it could be a, a numeric score. That is fine. Um, and also, depending on where you went to school, these could be called transcripts, they could be called mark sheets. As long as that information is there, they will be considered a transcript that we are looking for. And the, the other part of information we have to have is the grading scale that your institution had used. So if it is, a, let's say, a, a letter grade scale from A to F, then we need to know what was the scale that was used in the GPA calculations. For example, was an A at your institution a 4.0, a 4.5, a 5? Um, so typically this information is available in the back of the transcripts, or sometimes you can find it at the very end of the transcript document, but there is a scale and we do need to have that scale. So make sure when you scan the copies that you're giving us all the grade information as well as the scale, grade scale information. Um, if it is on the back of the page, you don't have to copy every single back of the page. No. We just need one record of the grade scale. Um, and that's what we will use for uh, reviewing the applications and making the admissions decisions. And for those students who are admitted to the degree program, then they will need to submit official transcripts. 
um, in your admissions letter, there will be some information about how to send these official transcripts. They have to be um, sent directly, either directly by your institution, or if you get a copy, then they have to be in sealed and signed envelopes that should not be opened. So if you already have a couple of copies of these official transcripts in sealed envelopes, I would say hold on to one of them without opening them and that could be considered official. But this is something that we can work with you um, for the admitted students. Okay. Uh, really quick, Vivica, can I just add something about the unofficial transcripts? Mm -hmm. so, for, um, so when uploading, scanning and uploading your transcripts, um, please be sure that it's it's legible, that we can see it. Um, take a quick minute to you know, open back up and see if you can read it. If you're not able to read it, chances are we won't be able to read it. We don't have any special tools here at CS to be able to decipher um, really blurry transcripts. Um, so please go ahead and take a minute to just be sure that it's clear, um, everything on there um, that we need is available um, and easily readable to us. Um, if you're uploading mark sheets, please um, include all of the mark sheets, so all eight terms versus just the last two years of your mark sheets. Um, also, um, yeah, so just be sure you include everything. Uh, we also will need to be able to see the institution name on the transcript um, and the degree conferral date on the transcript. So that just helps along the process immensely. Thank you, Christine, for that reminder. So, so debate, again, that's a good point that we need to see that your degree has been awarded or that you're expecting to have it awarded in, let's say, before you start the bachelor, uh, the master's program. So for some transcripts, you won't see that the degree has been awarded, in which case, please upload a copy of your um, certificate of degree, which shows the degree has been awarded. But some transcripts actually show that the degree has been awarded. It's part of the notation. And if you have that information on your transcripts, at this point, we wouldn't need to see the um, certificate of um, degree. Okay. Anything else, Christine? That. I think that's it, that covers it. Um, and uh, during admission review, if there's anything that comes up, you know, we will contact you if there is missing information, so. But it does help us if all the information is provided at the time you submit the application. And it helps Absolutely. Um, Yeah. So the, the last item on this slide are the standardized tests. There are some questions on the Q&A too, which we will go in and mark as answered. GRE or GMAT are not required. Now, if you have taken GRE and you have a score report, you can certainly include that as part of your application. Just um, scan a PDF copy and attach it. You do not have to send those official scores directly to the university. If you are, so the next part is TOEFL or IELTS. These are language proficiency requirements for students who have their um, previous educational experience in a country that where the language spoken, the first language spoken is not English. So I could have gone to, um, to a, through a bachelor's program where the full education was completed in English but if that country is not considered a country where English is the first language, then I would still need to submit TOEFL scores or IELTS scores. Um, at the very basic level, um, TOEFL scores are on the um, screen. For those of you who might be on phones, we require a TOEFL um, IBT score of 103 or higher, a CBT score of 253 or higher, and a PBT of 610 or higher. And the most common um, score that we see would be the IBD scores. Mm -hmm. If you take IELTS, um, the overall score has to be a 6.5 or higher. And then the scores have to be less than two years old at time of, um, at time of um, starting the program. So if, since you are going to be applying for spring of 2019, any score that is from January 2017 forward would be eligible. And if your scores are older than that, then you would have to retake and provide us new scores. So this is the basic requirement, but remember I um, said something about giving us all the information on your CV or, or your resume. 
So I'm just going to make up an example. I come from Sri Lanka. My undergraduate degree was completed in English, but it doesn't give me the um, exemption from TOEFL's course. There are two exemptions that we can make. One, you might have had another degree in the past five years completed in, a, in an eligible country where the um, language of um, spoken language was English. And that's based on educational requirements. So even if you were an international student, if you had a second degree, or if your first degree was from one of the eligible countries, then you're exempted from for admissions requirements. Or you may have been working in, a, in an eligible country in the past two years at least. In that case, we can, the department, the graduate college will allow an exemption from the TOEFL or IELTS course. So this is why it's important for us to see if your degree might be from a country that is not eligible for an exemption, but you may have worked in a country that is eligible for the past two years. If you are in that situation, please take a look on our website and it is, it is detailed out there what you would need to do. We would, be, we would require you to document that for us to get that exemption of, uh, based on your work experience. I think we can. Yep, that, yep, that covers it, I think. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and move on to the next slide. Okay. Um, tuition and financial aid, um, who would like to cover that? I can start with tuition. So tuition for the MCS uh, and the MCS DS is charged per credit hour, and that's different than what we charge our other online programs or our on-campus students. Their, their UP are range-based tuition, and it's actually quite costly. Uh, the Master of Computer Science degree on campus can cost forty to $60,000, depending on how long you take to... Uh, completed. Um, the, the MCS degree, that very same degree, um, will cost you under $20,000 in tuition um, through the uh, uh, Coursera platform. Um, the way we offer the course through the Coursera platform is that um, it's offered asynchronous, asynchronously online. So um, the lectures are delivered as MOOC lesson videos, but in addition to those MOOC lesson videos, you'll also be taking proctored exams, um, and completing programming projects. All of those things will have deadlines throughout the semester, but you will get all the material you need um, for classes once they're in, in full swing. Um, you'll get all that material on day one. Um, so as soon as you join the class, you can see the schedule of what's, uh, what's due in the class, and then you can work ahead as need be. We have many students that, you know, a work event comes up, a family event comes up, uh, they need to take a, a break. Um, as long as you know that that's going to be coming up, you have the opportunity to work at whatever pace you need. But in order for us to complete all the students in the class by the end of the semester, we have to follow these deadlines. And so there will be work that's required uh, throughout, the, uh, throughout the semester. Uh, we charge per course, so $600 per credit hour uh, you need eight courses to finish the, um, the MCS and the MCS DS. That's uh, 32 credit hours, so each course is four credit hours. That would be $2,400 for tuition. On top of that, there's also some additional fees. Uh, you have to pay for the two MOOCs that have the lesson videos and some of the other structure for the course. That's an additional $158 uh, per course. Uh, you have to pay for the proctoring that uh, when you take an exam, you will schedule, it's almost like an Uber service, you will schedule a proctor that uh, you will connect with you online. And that's to make sure we are very, you know, um, we want all of our students to be treated fairly and we don't want any, uh, any student to suffer because another student was able to get an unfair advantage through, through cheating on an exam. So we proctor all of our exams. Uh, we do that online through this proctor use service. Um, that proctoring needs to happen from the student end uh, so uh, you'll typically have to pay maybe forty dollars in proctoring uh, services um, for each course that you take. Uh, so there are, there are a few additional fees that will push us up above twenty thousand dollars. All total, um, typically the the degree is about twenty two thousand dollars, and that's a steal compared to our uh, master's degree that we offer on campus or uh, in, in other fashions. Um, 
and uh, uh, there's financial aid available. Let me stress that uh, this degree is fully accredited. Uh, as with all of our other degrees, it went through the same accreditation process as our other as our other degrees, um, uh, accredited by the HLC. Um, when you get your Master of Computer Science degree, you're getting the exact same degree as the person that took the program on campus. There's nothing on the degree that says online. Um, there is nothing on the degree that says you, you completed it through this Coursera platform or that your tuition rate was different than, than the other students. Um, and if you, get the, if, you, if you use the data science track, there's also no indication of data science on the degree or in your transcripts, but you're free to say MCS data science or MCS DS on your resume, on LinkedIn, in any place else, uh, uh, that, that will be fine. Everybody knows about the MCSDS, so um, it's, uh, you, you, can, you can specify that as you're uh, applying for a job or other, uh, uh, other credentials. Um, so because it was accredited and it's a full degree like every other offering, we've been offering online degrees on this campus since the 60s. We invented a lot of online education with the Plato system in the 60s and 70s. We were doing distance education before there was an internet. We've been offering the MCS online since the 90s. So we, we make sure that our online classes and our online degrees meet the same standards as every other class. Um, they, don't do, they don't follow a special route through the approval process. They follow the same, same route, meet the same standards for an on-campus class or an online class. Um, and because of that, uh, HLC accredited this degree as they accredit all of our degrees. That means these degrees are eligible for financial aid if you do need some help. Um, um, for some graduate students, especially if you're doing a thesis or in our Master's of Science or um, our, uh, our PhD programs, those are much more difficult to get into. Uh, there you would be uh, working in addition to taking the coursework, you'd also be writing a thesis with an advisor. It's, it's a much more difficult way to a master's degree and significantly more difficult to a PhD degree. The MCS is a coursework-based degree. It prepares, um, it prepares students for uh, a profession. It's a professional master's degree. It's what employers are looking for. Um, it, it shows that you've got graduate coursework in computer science, that same graduate coursework that a student with a PhD would be taking. Um, uh, but it's focusing on that coursework and you can hit the ground running with, uh, with the skills you need to be a successful computer scientist or a data scientist. Um, so uh, financial aid, um, the Department of Computer Science will sometimes offer assistantships and other support for the MS and PhD students. That's to um, those research assistantships, um, teaching assistantships are, um, are offered to those students when they're on campus. They're not available to any of our on, online students. So the department doesn't have uh, any of those assistantships or other uh, scholarships or anything available to students in this program. But uh, federally, you're uh, eligible to apply for financial aid from any program that you might want to. Um, the program is eligible for financial aid, and you can find some details on um, financial aid opportunities um, elsewhere, not, not through the University of Illinois, not through the Department of Computer Science, but in general, um, if you go to the link, uh, that osfa.illinois.edu link. Uh, do you want to take it from there? Um, I was just talking about financial, financial aid. aid so. Right. So um, the, um, the last part is we have a lot of our students who are full-time or working professionals and some, sometimes their employer might um, sponsor their education. So if you are in that situation, it is um, that there's a mechanism on in place on campus where your, your sponsor can be directly billed so that you, I mean, you would see the bills but they would be directly billed and they can make arrangements to pay the university on your behalf. Um, there's a URL Provided on this slide, you can find information there if your um, if your organization qualifies to do that. There are some requirements about the number of students, etc., but those details can be found on the website. The other thing that we may not have on the next slide is to say if you are going to be um, self-funding your education, there is also the opportunity for you to sign up for a payment plan. So if you sign up before the semester starts, then you will have a higher number of um, installments that you can use to pay 
So if you're thinking of these, these um, if you have these considerations about how am I going to um, self fund my master's degree, there are some resources available to you to kind of um, pay through the semester. And you are only billed for the number of credit hours you That's take right. in that That's term. Right. So we, there's no upfront payment for the full program. If I take one class of four credit hours, then my semester tuition is going to be twenty four hundred dollars. So there are there are options available for you as you look at the program. And that's that's different than the on campus students. On campus, if you're not taking any classes, you still have to pay tuition. If you're not taking any classes in this program, you don't have to pay any tuition for that semester. If you need to take a semester off, you can. What we do ask is that all students in the program let us know if they're not taking any classes that semester. Mm -hmm. Uh, we need to keep track of um, of all of our students, make sure they're progressing well, and have uh, you know if if you have any needs um, or having any difficulties, we want to hear about that so we can adapt the program uh, to to those needs. But we don't want to hear from every every student every semester, even if they're not taking classes. But you don't have to pay for that semester if you're not taking any classes. Great. Okay, I'm going to advance to the next slide. Um, yeah. So this is our last slide. Um, th these are just some important um, URLs for people to visit. Um, there's the application link, um, application status link, financial aid office, and the program website. And so that concludes the slide deck. Um, and then we're going to go ahead and just answer some questions from the Q&A. We have quite a few, so hopefully we can get through most of them. And I know that we've been answering them as we've been going through. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing my screen. Um, and, and then John, go, I'm just gonna go ahead and start reading off some questions from the Q&A, if that works. Um, okay, so I'm just gonna start from the top here. So Muhammad asks, what is the value of a non-thesis degree versus a thesis degree? Yeah, yep. So students typically get a, a, master's, uh, a, a master's of science in computer science, where they write a thesis and, and get a PhD, a doctoral degree in computer science. Um, those students will go on to, to become professors and teachers uh, uh, and academics, or to work in research. Um, uh, in either industry or, uh, or, or for, you know, government institutions and so on. Uh, the MCS is designed for uh, practitioners of computer science. It's a professional degree. It gives you the skills you need to uh, kind of hit the ground running in a job, um, but not necessarily to jump into the research of, uh, uh, it doesn't, uh, it's not the degree you would get if you were going to continue on for a PhD. Uh, you can continue on for a PhD, but um, typically, um, uh, for our PhD applicants, we look for some prior experience with, with research, and the MCS is not designed to, to focus students on computer science research. It's designed to focus students on computer science practice. And okay, great. And to kind of segue into that, um, there's another question on here, John, that's the, uh, someone was asking, if they did the MCS, would they be eligible later on to move to a PhD? Yes, they would. Uh, the MCS doesn't give you uh, the research experience. So for um, our PhD and Master's of Science programs are um, very difficult to get into. You need a significantly higher GPA, you need research experience, you need to be working in a field that's closely aligned with, uh, with you know, the professors that we have. And so it's a very uh, much more difficult, uh, much more limited experience we have. The point of this degree is to focus on the coursework, on a professional degree, what employers are looking for, and to be able to provide that educational opportunity to a University of Illinois computer science and data science education to as many people as possible. That was one of our charges in our land grant mission. Great, thank you. Um, so then the next, um, there are some questions that are asking about how exactly are the courses taught? Can students do work at their own pace? How do they interact with faculty and teaching staff? Could you oh, speak to that? Yeah, so um, you can work at your own pace. Um, uh, and what I mean by that, you can work ahead as fast as you want. Um, there will be due dates. And unlike a MOOC, um, you can't miss a due date because we are working on a semester schedule and um, these assignments are going to be TA graded. There's TA and instructor interactions. And so you have to at least be up uh, 
at the rate that the class is progressing. But you'll see all the information, all the due dates, all the assignments will be available to you up front. So you can work ahead as fast as, as you like, especially if you know you're going to need some time away from the class uh, later on. Um, you'll know what you need to do for the class in order to be able to work ahead. So it is self-paced in, in that sense. But because it's TA graded and instructor graded, uh, we have to have assignments handed in by um, fixed deadlines. And the same with the uh, examinations. You can take the examination early, but you can't take the examination late because we need to be able to report the grades and talk about the exam and, and so on. Uh, in terms of interactions, our on-campus students, uh, they will come to class, sometimes they ask a question, but most of the time they don't. We have classroom discussions on a system called Piazza, which is like a bulletin board system. It's a discussion group for our classes. And our on-campus students do most of their classroom discussions in that online setting. We use the exact same online setting for our classes uh, offered on the Coursera platform. And in fact, we offer our Coursera platform classes online to you at the same time as our on-campus classes, and we often use the exact same discussion group because we're covering the same material. And so you may be discussing the material you're learning online with a, a student that's on campus learning the same material uh, in, in a classroom setting and benefiting from the exact same uh, uh, conversations between other students and with the uh, teaching staff. Okay, great, thank you. So there's a few um, questions regarding how, like time commitment, how long does, you know, how, how many hours should a student expect to spend on a course? Um, how long would it take, you know, to complete the degree or how much time do students, you know, have to complete the degree and what is the expected rate of completion for most Good. students? Um, so uh, each course will take uh, between 10 to 12 hours a week of time. So um, you, need to, you need to finish eight courses uh, to complete the degree. Uh, so each of those courses, you should budget 10 to 12 hours a week for a 15-week semester. In the summertime, that's, uh, that's over 12 weeks, so it's a, a little bit more time per week to, uh, to complete that course. The, um, uh, you need to complete eight courses, so you can finish the degree in as little as one year. Every course is offered at least once per year. So um, you can finish the course in as little as one year. Um, if you take one class per semester, we have a fall semester, a spring semester, then a summer term. There aren't as many courses available in the summer term, but there are courses available in the summer term. Um, so if you're taking one course each semester, most students will finish up in less than three years, somewhere between two and three years. Uh, that's a leisure pace. That's, uh, that's a part-time student. You're spending 12, 10 to 12 hours per week on your courses. If you're, if you're finishing up in one year, you're taking three courses a semester, that's 36 hours uh, per week. That's a full-time student, and you would treat that as a full-time job. Uh, and it's important to budget as much, you know, a, a sufficient amount of time to be able to complete those courses. The other uh, uh, thing I'll add is that that 10 to 12 hours is a weekly average. And some weeks it may be less, some weeks it may be more, and depending on how you work, if you wait to the last moment to finish your assignments, and many, many students and some professors do wait to the last minute to finish <laughs> their work, uh, then you'll be working more than 10 or 12 hours uh, up to those deadlines. But we give you every opportunity to be able to work ahead to even that out and make sure that that workload fits with your work um, schedule, with your uh, family schedule, and any other uh, uh, things that, you may be going, that may be going on in the semester. Okay, great. And um, students do have up to five years to complete the degree. So just to add that really quick. Um, let's see. There are some questions. Let's see here. Oh, here's an interesting one. Um, is it possible to skip some courses via an exam? Um, I think they're thinking like maybe proficiency out of, an ex of a course if they've taken, if they have experience. Yeah, no, we, we, don't, uh, we don't offer that option. Um, the HLC has, a, uh, um, has a, an accreditation and offers for that, but that doesn't allow for financial aid, for example. And, um, and so we don't offer that option. Okay. Um, and then there are some questions on here regarding uh, comparing, asking for a comparison between um, Illinois MCS versus other university oh, MCS. Oh, yeah, we are much better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
yes. Look, I think the rankings of universities just came out in U.S. News and World Report. You can see how much better we are uh, based on those rankings uh, uh, than, than, than you know many of the other options that, that people would have for computer science education. The difference is that uh, that high ranking means that there's a lot of demand for this degree. And in the past, we had to turn away students that had perfect test scores, mm -hmm. that had uh, uh, all sorts of great qualifications because we had very few seats available in our classrooms, uh, very few uh, uh, opportunities for those students. And being able to provide um, an online um, opportunity for this degree through the Coursera platform that scales up to a larger number of students and to be able to use that scale to be able to lower the price gives uh, that, that kind of uh, high quality educational opportunity to a much broader population than we were able to handle before. Okay, great. Um, here's a good question. I've checked a course content of this program and it seems cloud computing concepts and application courses are also listed on the course on Coursera, which I've completed. So the MOOCs. Yeah. Um, my question is, do I still need to attend these specific courses as part of the MCS degree? Do I need to do it again and pay again? Um, I just want to understand how this works. It's yeah. a good question. Yeah, I, uh, Christine, I don't believe that the student would need to pay for the MOOC again. They don't need it. So if you've completed the MOOC versions uh, prior to being admitted and enrolled in the four credit portion of the course, you won't need to pay for that MOOC again that transfers over directly from your record on your previous Coursera account. Um, and then you don't, you don't need to retake the MOOC again. Um, you will have to complete the four credit components of the course to get credit for it towards the degree. But other than that, you won't need to repeat it. So, so uh, what, what you've done by completing the MOOC is the same as if you showed up to the university and sat in on one of our classes. You can just pop in. We generally don't take um, attendance, and you can sit and learn the material for free. You'll be sitting next to students that are paying a fortune for that class, and you're learning the material for free. You're just not taking any of the tests. You're not getting a grade. It's not good, you know, your knowledge of that material isn't being uh, uh, documented or credentialed. Um, that's that's what the MOOC experience gives you um, is is kind of that uh, that learning aspect of the of the, of the lectures. On, on top of that, for credit, you need to you need to pass proctored comprehensive examinations. You need to do full semester long projects and programming projects, machine problems. Um, those are graded by TAs, and we provide additional TA and instructor guidance towards the completion of those projects. That's the for credit experience. So if you've already taken the the lecture experience, then you can just repeat the class, skip the lectures, and complete those projects and get credit. Okay, um, next question. Uh, Karen asks, is there a required sequence for courses taken? Are electives available at the beginning? Uh, there's very few uh, prerequisite sequences. So once you, once, you enroll, once you are admitted to the program, you can take um, any of the courses. The exception is that we have a 500 level machine learning class that requires our 400 level machine learning class. So you have to take applied machine learning before you can take practical statistical learning. Okay, and uh, we have some capstone classes. In order to take those capstone classes at the 500 level, you have to complete uh, two of the 400 level um, classes in that capstone area. Okay. Next question is from Edward. Edward is wondering, um, he's a former humanities student, is it possible to take CS 225 or CS 400 from Illinois on Coursera or any other specific certified courses online such as Code Academy data science courses that can compensate for the non-mathematical background? Right. So if you if you take that, you can. It's not as strong as if you take it for credit, say from a community college or some other institution. Uh, if you take it online in the MOOC form, then you should probably complete a, a specialization sequence. That specialization sequence will result in a certificate. And if you send us the URL to that certificate, such as on the Coursera.org uh, website, then we will consider that um, it's, it's not as strong as, as uh, graded uh, transcripted coursework, but we will consider that. Um, uh, CS225 is not offered online through the Coursera platform, but CS400, when we launch it, will be available for credit 
utilizing the Coursera platform in the same way that we utilize Coursera, the Coursera platform for other four credit courses. So that may be an option to you as early as this spring. So just stay tuned for uh, um, more news on that. Uh, we haven't released it yet, but that's our plan. Okay, great. Uh, Christopher asks, can you take more than eight courses if you're still interested in other courses? That's a good question. Do you want me to take that? Yeah, please. <laughs> It's what we recommend. Like you have to complete 32 credit hours. And when you complete those 32 credit hours, um, we would like you to graduate with your Master of Computer Science degree. If you wish to continue your learning experience, then you can, you can ask the department to allow you to register as a non-degree student. So if, why is it good for you? Because you will be earning your degree at the end of 32 hours, you will have an added credential. It will give you an advantage if you are looking to move on and move up in your career. And you can still continue to learn in the program as a non-degree student. So that would be the clean answer. Good, good. So, so it's eight and out. It's eight so, and out. So and once you get the 32 uh, credit hours, we're going to kick you out. <laughs> we're going to give you a, a <laughs> master's degree whether you want it or not. We're, we're against your your wishes, we're going to give you a master's degree. But um, what that does do is it opens up the opportunity to take the, the courses non-degree. And we don't give that, we don't allow other students to do that. So uh, many institutions will have non-degree options for their courses um, that anybody can just sign up for and take. That's not the case for the University of Illinois Computer Science courses. Even if you wanted to take one or two courses from us non-degree, um, you still have to be admitted and have the same qualifications to be able to get into those courses. And the reason is, is that you'll be taking those courses as a degree student. You're going to have many other students in that course as well. And we, we want to make sure that the course process for our students isn't disrupted by uh, individuals that, uh, that uh, are taking the course that maybe don't have the qualifications to get through and succeed in the course. Um, um, when we have a student in the course that, that doesn't have the prerequisites, that hasn't been properly admitted to the program, um, that can create a lot of, uh, that can create a larger drain on the resources of our teaching staff. Um, and we want to make sure we can focus those teaching resources on, on all of the students uh, uniformly uh, to make sure every student's getting, you know, getting their money's worth out of the course. Okay, perfect. So we're almost at the top of the hour, but I'm going to go ahead and do one more question before we wrap up. Uh, Philip is wondering, is there an opportunity to specialize in topics of interest? Um, that is, time series machine learning might be a tangible interest in the program, but is there a way to tailor coursework to focus on the specific area? Uh, yes, you can. Um, uh, you will need to take four courses um, in, in breadth, so four different areas of computer science. You know, we offer coursework in cloud computing, in data mining, in um, uh, data visualization in HCI, uh, coursework in machine learning, uh, coursework in scientific computing, uh, coursework in, in programming languages, um, a, a, a wide variety of these uh, areas of computer science. So you, you'll need to take four courses in, in, in four different areas. Uh, so that's half your coursework. Three courses at the 500 level, and that leaves a, a, an elective. Uh, some of those 500 level course choices um, can build on your 400 level courses, and then you have this additional eighth uh, course that you can take. Um, so you can focus those courses in the areas of cloud computing, in machine learning, um, in statistics, in uh, information science. There's all sorts of areas that you can focus your, your degree on based on uh, that selection of coursework but you can't focus all eight courses on one narrow area. Um, we have, uh, uh, we wanna make sure that students we graduate have breadth in computer science. Often you'll start your career in one area, but you may transition to another area. And we wanna make sure that all of our graduates have a broad fundamental knowledge, a deep, broad and deep um, knowledge of the fundamentals of computer science to be able to take, take on any number of problems uh, important to industry these days. 
Great. Um, so there are still a lot of questions on here. I think the questions doubled within the last two minutes. Um, we were not, so apologies if we were not able to get to your questions, um, but please do feel free to send an email to mcs at cs.illinois.edu um, for follow ups. Um, I typed it into the chat box there for you to grab, and we can address your questions there. Um, one question I did see pop up, I'd like to go ahead and uh, cover now, um, so we don't get a bunch of emails about it, perhaps, is um, if you've submitted an application for spring 2018, thank you very much. Um, we will be reviewing um, applications after the close of the application on October 15th. Um, announcements will be made on November 15th. Um, so we don't have rolling admissions at this time, so we are not able to give you early decisions. So again, October 15th is the application deadline. November 15th is when you will hear about the decision. Um, I'll repeat that one more time. Fifth, October 15th and November 15th. And so can I jump in? Because yes, in, please. In that period, we will be sending out admissions decisions in groups. Yep. So if you see on an online chat space that, hey, yes. somebody else received a decision, um, it's uh, bear with us because they are going to be coming waves during that month when we are releasing decisions. Yes. Yep. Okay. So yep. again, we make um, some decisions early on rejections. We make some decisions early on acceptances. We make some some need further work, and and so if you haven't heard from us, it's because we're fighting um, desperately to, uh, to to look at your at every aspect of, of your application and everybody else's application to give everybody uh, as much chance as possible to get admitted to this program. Yes. So again, um, if you have follow-up questions that we could not get to, um, please submit your question to mcs at cs.illinois.edu. Thank you, everyone, for taking the time to join us today, and um, we hope to see you sometime again soon. Thank you, John and Vivica. Great. Thanks Thank so much. You. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Bye-bye.